So I want to start out and introduce the context for the work that we've been doing on Willow, give you some idea of where I'm doing the work and why I'm doing the work I'm doing. And then uh, toward the end, we'll get into the specifics on the actual um, Willow data. So the Lake Superior Woody Biomass Trials were launched in 2009, 2010, primarily in response to this facility. This is the Bayfront Power Plant, which is located on, uh, in Ashland in Lake Superior, south shore of Lake Superior in the Schwamigan Bay. They go through that little wood pile that will cycle through, oh, in about a week. They go through about just under 300,000 green tons of wood per year, um, primarily coming out of um, uh, manufacturing waste from a local LP uh, chipboard plant and uh, some harvest residues, power line right of ways, some railroad ties and some tires that they'll use to co-fire it as well. So there was an interest, there's three boilers, there's an interest in converting entirely from uh, coal to biomass and they were wondering where they're going to get the wood. This was in 2007-8 when everybody was going to put in new wood fired installations and so they were really concerned about it. So they came to me looking at purpose grown uh, short rotation woody plantings on our agricultural lands and provided some funding. Now this sort of scratching our head because everything that you see that has color on here is forest land. This is Ashland Bayfield County. Why would we grow woodies? Um, well, you can see it's pretty complicated. All of these different, are different management units. We have tribal lands, national forest lands, county lands, private lands, private lands that are in state uh, forestry programs that manage forest law program. So access to that wood is not as simple as it seems. Also, the um, chances of getting the harvest residues out are complicated as well. So there's, even though we live in the forest, there's a real question about how much is available, particularly at the scale when we're talking about power plant sizes. Um, the other big part of this is that where the purpose grown has a place is that Lake Superior is um, the driving force behind conservation efforts to try to protect water quality of Lake Superior. And this is for a couple of reasons why. This is the, um, within the Bad River Tribe, the Kakagan Sloughs. This is an internationally recognized wild rice bed and um, upstream effects could have a, a real impact on this kind of water system and estuary. This is the Fish Creek Slough at the head of the Schwamigan Bay and you can see the sediment export coming out of the, the water. So we don't really have much of an erosion problem in our counties. We have a water volume problem that because of when we clear out some of the forest land for agricultural land, um, we end up with uh, flash high peak flows and blows out the stream banks of the glacial till and it washes out into the bay. So under that context, there's been work to slow the flow uh, to try to reduce the, the volume of water leaving these landscapes or the rate that it leaves those. And one of the things is they want to get at least 40% um, of all watershed units covered in forest land to try to desynchronize the snow melt and to try to catch more of that rainfall to try to reduce the peak flows. This is the primary agricultural region in the Marengo watershed and you can see uh, that's where their primary goal is to get some more woodies on the landscape. So it's really at a kind of a micro scale conservation project that we're trying to do internationally, if you will. So the same issues. How do you get farmers to put trees back on the landscape when their parents and grandparents spent their, their, uh, their time ch clearing stumps off to be able to farm that land, right? And that's the challenge. So this is something what it looks like. And I throw this picture up because here's the Schwamigan Bay. And it doesn't look all that different than the kind of slides that are used to promote agroforestry. So we kind of already have an agroforestry system without any, uh, even trying. However, we've got some um, issues within certain watersheds where we've got these drainages, we've got water moving out. Can we deploy some of these woody perennials in a way that you can make money selling to the power plant or, or uh, pellet mills of some kind, and then also targeted conservation efforts. So that's why the, the trials, trying to look at agroforestry practices as a way to, to encourage the planting of these woody species. So the, the biomass trials was, um, were launched 2010. We have more or less funding through 2017, which we've been able to keep this funded here for a while. And we hope to get through 2019, and then we'll see what happens at that point. Um, three major parts to it. One are clonal trials to determine the best genetics of some of these candidate species, particularly willow and poplar. Um, we're looking at some yield trials so we can build economic models. As we know, this is the challenge, especially in willow, why we don't have wide-scale adoption because it doesn't work numbers-wise yet. And then looking at demonstration plantings to enable adoption so farmers 
are interested in this, how would they actually deploy these kinds of plantings? So very much an applied type research uh, project. Um, just an idea of where these are. There's actually three locations, four locations now. Um, different scenarios, and I'll show photos of these as we go. So this is at the old ag station up just out, outside Ashland. Uh, we're on private land as well. Uh, a, a farmer that doesn't have enough time to do anything uh, well. Right? So this is a great place of real life agroforestry to see how these trials, rather than you know, the groomed things that look nice on an on a, um, ag station. Then we're also using some old NM6 clones uh, tr uh, trial plantings looking at some management post-harvest. Um, once you've grown your, your hybrid poplar to your 10 years or whatever it is, what do you do after that fact? So we already had those, so we decided to use them. And then recently with Rich Strait's help, um, we've got some funding at uh, a Forest Service installation. This is a visitor center in Ashland. And here's the before, and here's our goal for after. And we're in the second, third year of those plantings. So they're, um, they're coming along. You can actually see them. And I need to get up to this spot and take a photo so we can see. Here's just the projected, but what it actually looks like so far. And within that planting, we've then incorporated some other trials, including a hazelnut germplasm trial and a highbush cranberry germplasm trial. All right, so let's go through some of these specific projects within the larger Lake Superior Woody Biomass Trials. First is we're evaluating some of Bill Bergeson's clones. Um, he's got 70 that he was interested in. We put these at two sites, both the ag station at, and on farm. And we've got six reps of each. This is the fifth year, so we've already made selections. We've chosen the top five clones, and we'll put those in yield blocks. Uh, we planted the first one last week. We'll do the when I get back this week. So we hope, because we know the G by E uh, is significant in hybrid poplar, and we're trying to find clones that do better on the clay soils of our region, the cold climate, and the short growing season. And we definitely saw some rise to the top out of these clone trials. Oops, here's a photo. Right, you got to include the, wow, they really grow fast photo. <laughs> there they go. Um, we're also looking at some alley cropping scenarios to think of ways, OK, if you don't want to cover your entire back 40 in trees? Are there ways that you can, in uh, a little lower density of planting? And this would be a scenario where you've got, you can just see the DN5 poplar rows growing. And they're uh, growing, I think they did um, oats that year. And here's what it looks like a couple years later. So they can still get through there with the hay bind and take a, a hay crop off as well. Uh, in this scenario, this was two years ago, and they'll be running the sheep under this uh, next year. This is the on-farm planting. So we'll have some silva pasture um, going on in this planting as well. Um, this, is the, this is a five-acre NM6 plant, planting that's put in 99. It was harvested in 2010. And we went in and left some of it to let it grow, um, and then harvested the rest. And then we're letting the stump sprout in one half of it. The other side, we tried to suppress them, and it doesn't work very well if anyone's tried to suppress stump sprouts. So instead, it's, the treatments have been changed to no stump sprout control to control it for one year and then let it go. Um, and then what we looked at is different site prep treatments. Instead of coming in and popping out these stumps, we went back in and did different site prep treatments and then actually replanted either with a single row of poplar or we put willow and then let these stump sprouts grow. And here's what it looks like. Um, and then after a while, you can't take a picture of these anymore because it's nothing but trees. But you can see the idea was to try to put some biological diversity back in this planting and manage it in a coppice system. So you're harvesting willow and poplar at the same time. So, Jason, um, yeah, go ahead. So uh, on that slide, mm -hmm. so on the one treatment, you, you suppress for one year the stump sprouts with Correct. the plantings of the new ones in between. Yep. And the other one you don't. Correct. Exactly. To try to give the new poplar and the new willow a, a head start. Okay. Yeah. And um, here's, oops. You can see this is the NM6 clone um, stump sprouting, and then we put DN5 as the new clone in between. And they held their own um, in the first year. You can see the willow between the rows also holding their own. Um, even in this, the plants where the stumps were allowed to grow right, right away. So the willow can keep up even with a, you know, not quite the same head start. And here again, the willow as well. I think I included. The one other photo I, I didn't include is that the, we had Marcinina move in 
took out the NM6, defoliated it entirely, the stump sprouts, but the DN5 inner plants were fine, weren't affected by Marcinina. So just a great illustrative example of the importance of this biological diversity within these kinds of systems. Um, so this data is still being collected and at some point maybe I'll come back and report on, on this trial as well. Okay, getting more into the willow, um, these are some production scale blocks. It's about a, an acre to an acre and a third at two sites. There's four clones. Basically, we just planted a block so that we could demonstrate production scale, both planting and then eventually harvesting. Um, here's the problem, though. If anybody knows of harvesting equipment, I'd sure like to know about it. Yeah, Jeff. What are they doing? Yeah, so the couple of options, you can basically harvest it like corn silage and chip it, blow it into a wagon, um, or you can bale it up, store it, dry it. Well, if we could find one, the only one I can find right now is in Quebec, and there's a couple of uh, harvesters in New York, but trying to get them here is almost impossible. Yeah. There is a bio baler in Minnesota. That's what I've heard, and then... The outfit that bought it went out of business, and it's sitting in storage, they're trying to sell it. Aha. Okay. You have a couple hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that should tell us all the state of this industry. We can't find right. any equipment to harvest this stuff. So maybe th this will work out in Quebec. But So meanwhile, we've got, what, about three acres of, of hybrid willow just sitting there. Uh, luckily, it doesn't grow very well where we live, so uh, we can let it go for a while. <laughs> I'm getting to that, though. Um, so one big thing we found is this is the same block planted, and you can see the variation in height and growth, right? So this is regular. We get this really nice-looking willow, and then it kind of tapers off. So same everything except for variation within that soil. And if you look at, so this is the nice site. You know, this is what we all have the, the willow pictures um, to make it look really nice. And then farther on, it, it looks terrible. So this is just um, some quick data we collected in terms of the standing uh, biomass and for the four clones and we just call it the good part of the stand or the poor part of the stand. You can see the difference in standing biomass and as you correlate that out with the, the um, soil you can see anytime we get clay up in the 30s it really just shuts down the production. Um, and so it comes to this, you know, we always talk about we're going to grow these crops on marginal lands, but we don't include the part about marginal yields for marginal lands. And this really il illustrates that point that if we're going to grow this on clay soils, we shouldn't expect much for yield. We've also put in a willow windbreak, again, trying to look at different demonstration scenarios or ways that we can accrue multiple benefits. Ideally, we'd like direct cash, cash benefits, but if we can get indirect benefits, that's, that's good too. Um, so we just put out, this is Fish Creek, it's about um, 2,000 feet worth of, of windbreak. And it will really, surprise, surprise, really works, right? So it does a couple of things. One, it works as a windbreak, but it also, every, all the other snow is melted off. So if you, you can do some uh, uh, desynchronization of the snow melt, we think, and deployment of these kinds of plantings. Um, so getting to more of the topic at hand, these are, um, this is the, um, germplasm trial we did with Willow. We did this at two sites. I'm reporting on the, the first site. We've got nine clones out of New York that we looked at. Why these nine? Th these are the nine that AA Willow thought at the time we should try. So we tried them. And the, it's randomized complete block, three replications. Our plots are two rows by 20 feet long. We try to uh, mitigate edge effect with some border rows and then each plot though is, is providing that edge. Uh, for the other, so we think it's valid. Um, put in 2010, we harvested last spring and basically just cut out the middle six stools per plot and weighed those, took a dry matter measurement as well. Nothing fancy about it, right? This is the advantage of the willow on the small plot work. You can just use a little chip grind grinder and chirp. Um, so what we found is no significant difference among these nine clones that we trialed. We did see a bit of a trend with Tully Champion Canastota rating out higher. You can see this tons, though, this is oven dry tons per acre per year, about 2.3 was the highest. Um, the Escanaba trials, which are the UP of Michigan, similar climate to ours, they found about the same for their willow clone yields. We get over to Wasika in Minnesota, we get closer to, to say three or four uh, oven dry tons per acre per year. So the yields aren't, aren't astounding. Um, 
and they seem fairly consistent. Why we're not seeing clonal differences, I'm not sure. Um, I think it might just be that they're all relatively low, so we don't see the magnitude, but there, we also have some variability within that site. Um, you, you saw the picture where just within 100 feet, you could have some pretty significant vari variation in soil, so that's part of it as well. Um, now the second, this is right you know, about a week after harvest, um, after the first rotation, and by the end of the year, um, we had more standing biomass at the, after the harvest in one year than we did at the harvest after three years. So we know this is true with willow plantings is second and third rotations, you, you start to see some more significant yields. First rotation is more or less that establishment phase. We also included poplar. I didn't show that data uh, as well, but poplar grow in the same system. And this is uh, Ray Miller out of Michigan has recommended this because he's finding pretty decent uh, yields off poplar grown in the willow system. Um, this is what it looks like about three days ago, so it's on its way. We also looked at nitrogen. We uh, looked at f uh, four rates of nitrogen, zero up to 120 pounds of actual N per acre per year, applied the second year after planting. So the first year it grows, you cut it back, and then we put our fertilizer on that spring. We used ammonium nitrate and did four rates, and then we've done this twice. This first trial we planted in 2010, we harvested it last spring. The second uh, replication of this trial, we will harvest at the end of this year. Um, similar to the clone trial, we really didn't see any difference among the four clones, and we also didn't see a nitrogen response, even up compared from the, the high rate of 120 pounds down or compared to zero. And looking through the literature, this is um, not uncommon to see a fairly low or, if any, response to nitrogen in the willow plantings. Um, exactly why, I'm not sure. Um, and we also didn't see a cultivar by nitrogen rate interaction as well. So to conclude here, hopefully within, within my time, I think it, in our case, marginal yields from marginal lands at least in this first rotation, is what we found. And we're also on these sites very close to Lake Superior, so our heat units are significantly reduced. As we move farther back from the lake, we may see uh, higher yields. Uh, but we also get out of the agricultural lands for our counties. Um, like I talked about, we're fairly consistent to Escanaba, but in Tim Volk's work, where he compiled all the trials at the time, um, were significantly lower than what they've seen elsewhere in the, in the upper Midwest. And again, nitrogen response is minimal, if any. So any questions? Yeah, Mark. Jason, did you do any other soil tests on the site there besides pH? Uh, we have phosphorus and potassium. Um, and I didn't put this on, on the uh, chart. But we basically, we didn't see much variation in phosphorus or potassium. Phosphorus, this was an agricultural field. Uh, managed by the research station, so there's a fair amount of manure. So phosphorus is, was in the high 20s. Potassium in, you know, 120, 130. And even across these different uh, clay contents, we saw those nutrients didn't vary all that much. So I think that's why I didn't include is there it. Any, do you think that there would be any advantage of getting some of that ash from that polar plant back on the sites? It would be great. The problem is they burn the tires, so we can't land spread it. I mean, we could with the permit, but as a soil amendment, it can't be used. Yeah, I think a lot of this has to do primarily just with the, uh, the bulk density yeah. of that soil. In, in the, um, when it dries out, it's a brick. When it's wet, it's gumbo. And so we just don't have the oxygenation in the soil. And, we, and when it's dry, it, the plants really aren't growing. So that's, that's, I think, the main problem is just that soil property. Any other questions? Uh, question. What, yeah. It, uh, what depth are um, these textures and pH? Uh, this is just a zero to six inch, and what you'll find on these soil types are 480Bs or Sambor Bad Rivers. Is basically it's a, a, a very narrow um, layer of silt loam, and then it could be 300 feet clay. Okay. This is all glacial lake bottom, mm -hmm. and so the same thing that happened is happening now happened as these glacial lakes receded. Um, it silts back in, clay back in. We get the stratified layers, but for the most part, it's really deep clay. So they're farming. If you drained Shawamigan Bay, 
and then farmed it, that's the same thing these guys are doing. You know, so it's the same. Great. Our, our next presenter Thank you. is presenting now. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Jason. I was going to say, our next presenter is also presenting in the other room. Um, David Smith. And so I didn't know if anybody has any. Um, Jason has a question. Yeah, yeah, please. So Jason, uh, the power plant's already doing something behind that. Yeah. Yeah. The idea is to kind of replace more of the coal. Correct. Um, you know, they wanted to go somewhere from 300,000 is sort of the max that they'll use in a given year. It just depends on weather and this, that, or the other. They want to get up to, they could go up to about 600,000. So the question is where do they get those, that additional 300,000 tons? And, and um, this was just going to be a small part of the puzzle. You know, it was never, we want 200,000 tons from the ag lands. It was, does this work? And can farmers make any money at what these guys can pay for biomass? And the answer right now is willows, no way. Uh, maybe poplar, we'll see, because some of those growth rates on the poplar clones are, are interesting. Um, I think over in Guelph, they had done some work with willow biomass landings in an alley cropping, so they had some taller trees and then the willow in between. Do you think that would help at all, or you don't see that the, the, the wind desiccation, that sort of thing, is really a factor on your growth? Um, you know, we really haven't evaluated it to know, but my suspicion is no. Um, it's especially, the clay. yeah, it's the clay that's holding it back and the heat units more than anything. Else. I wonder if those, if you had some taller trees that you got <coughs> part of the sequence, they would have to be wide enough not to compete, but would maybe help hold some of the heat and maybe uh, by not having air movement from the, yeah. the bay. I, I don't know if we would have to make a difference. We'll see on the um, planting at the visitor center. Mm -hmm. We've got incorporated that's more of a traditional windbreak planting. So we've got the poplar mixed in there with the willow. We actually have the willow on the um, well, the windward side, so it may not be the best scenario, but we'll see. Yeah, what? How much natural falls from poplar do you have up there? Uh, it's isolated to small pockets, and we tend to see it within drainages, not up outside, primarily because I think it's discouraged. It's, yeah, it, it's limited in the amount that Yeah, and I don't, you know, in our, we've also got some, I didn't show pictures, but we've got hybrid aspen in these plantings, and we're able to keep the deer off the hybrid poplar with plant skin. Um, we cannot keep them off the hybrid aspen, and I don't know what they do to the balsam poplar, but any of the native aspens, uh, poplars, they just, they don't care what's on sprayed on there, they'll eat it. Hybrid poplar, for whatever reason, they more or less leave it alone, if it's got plant skin on it. And in our region, you know, we wish we could plant trees and shrubs, <laughs> but we just have such high deer populations. We gotta be on it and keep them on it. All right, thank you. Great. Well, while we're waiting there, um, I didn't know if anybody wants to bring up any other kind of points of discussion about biomass in general, or we can just take a few minute break until David's done in the other room.
That's a great point. And uh, another Iowa example of, I know the University of Iowa is planting, I think, 120 acres of, that could, that could be wrong, of miscanthus that they're going to then burn in the power plant um, like this. But again, I think that was uh, kind of industry saying, we can do this, and um, they found kind of a, a partner to do that with. So I think that's a, that's a great point. Of, um, Farmers wanting to do stuff but not having, we don't have kind of the manpower to, or the production or you know, conversion to do it. Okay. We'll maybe take a, fill up your, you fill up your coffee or something, we'll always wait for David, at least I'm going to. One of the values of the plots that, that Jason has this visitor, visitor center gets about 100,000 people a year. And so there's this little demo, but his research lots are only off a mile down the road. And so they can have signage and, and, and easily get people to see and, and educate people. When you have that many people coming through an area and seeing a demo, uh, you have the potential to catch the eye of maybe that right person or a few of the right people. It's a very visible site. Yeah. 